I'm Dr. Adam Persella, Senior Vice President and Provost at Cairn University. I've spent most of my professional career helping students and parents of students navigate the transition into college, from the housing process and academic preparation to financial aid and the cost of college. By the end of this short video, you will have a better understanding of how university admissions and financial aid departments put together financial aid packages for accepted students, how to work with university admissions counselors and financial aid administrators to get the best financial aid package possible, and what factors to consider when evaluating your financial aid package and the true cost of college. The financial aid process can seem overwhelming to even the most financially savvy student. Colleges and universities in America are complex systems of bureaucracy. Even at smaller colleges, incoming students find themselves interacting with professionals from multiple student support departments across campus, both during the application process and after. It helps to know who to go to and when with your questions. Let me introduce you to some of the key people you'll likely be interacting with throughout your college application process. The admissions counselor. During the admissions process, especially early on in that process, your admissions counselor can serve as a one-stop shop for all your questions. Admissions counselors are usually recent college graduates. They are typically very outgoing, easy to talk to, and generally knowledgeable about application requirements, procedures, and financial aid. Throughout the admissions process, your admissions counselor will be your advocate, your cheerleader, and the coach in your corner, the financial aid administrator. The financial aid administrator is the person ultimately responsible for awarding aid and for ensuring the university's financial aid practices are compliant with state and federal guidelines. They're very knowledgeable about the financial aid process and are the best people to ask about loans, grants, scholarships, and work-study programs. Don't worry, we'll get to all those things later. Like your admissions counselor, the financial aid administrator is a resource for you. However, unlike your admissions counselor, they are not going to give you their cell phone number. The college bursar. Bursar is an archaic term from a bygone era, the use of which can now only be found within the hollowed halls of education. The bursar is responsible for billing of student tuition accounts. This responsibility involves sending bills and working with students to make payment plans. Their ultimate goal is to bring your account into a paid in full status, which is great because that's your goal too. Just keep in mind that bursars are not typically involved in the financial aid process. The registrar. The registrar processes registration requests, schedules classes, and maintains class lists, enforces the rules of entering or leaving classes, and keeps a permanent record of grades. The registrar will also evaluate transfer credits. They are knowledgeable about course scheduling, course requirements, and grad requirements. Now that you have a sense for who you'll be interacting with during the admissions process and what resources are available to you, Let's talk about the financial aid process itself. Could you tell me what the acronyms COA, SAR, and EFC stand for? Could you explain what the FAFSA is, what the acronym stands for, and how colleges use it? Do you know how to find out what the net price of a college is, or how much debt the average college graduate takes on? If not, you're not alone, don't worry. The financial aid process might seem complicated, but it's fairly similar from one college to the next. And with a basic understanding of how this process works, you'll be well positioned to navigate the many financial decisions related to college choice and degree completion. Most college students receive some form of financial aid. This aid can come in the form of scholarships, which are normally distributed from the student's college or university, or from federal aid, which can come in the form of grants, work study, or loans. Approximately 85% of students receive some sort of financial aid from the federal government. The process of receiving financial aid from and through your college or university begins with your FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Students apply for federal grants, work study, and loans with the free application for federal student aid, 
or FAFSA form. Colleges use the data collected from your FAFSA to determine your federal aid eligibility. Colleges also use FAFSA data to award their own aid called institutional aid. After you complete and submit your FAFSA, you will receive confirmation that it was submitted and opportunity to review the student aid report, which is a summary of the FAFSA information. The FAFSA becomes available on October 1st and needs to be completed every year for students interested in receiving financial aid. The primary function of the FAFSA is to help colleges and universities determine what your EFC is. Your EFC, or Expected Family Contribution, is a number that determines your student eligibility for certain types of federal student aid. This number is calculated using the information that students provide on the FAFSA. College Financial Administrators, or FAAs, subtract the EFC from what's called the Cost of Attendance, or COA, to determine the student's need for federal student financial assistance. Types of federal assistance includes federal Pell Grants, subsidized loans, federal supplemental educational opportunity grants, and federal student work study. Student financial need is a difference between cost and ability to pay. Colleges and universities use the basic formula COA minus EFC to calculate a student's financial need, COA minus EFC equals need. So, for example, say the cost of attendance at your college or university is $40,000, and say your expected family contribution is $10,000, then your financial need would be $30,000. What then? It then becomes a matter for the college or university to help you meet the gap between your EFC and the COA. This gap, as we've already mentioned, is your financial need and institutions will meet your financial need through financial aid, which comes in the form of loans, grants, and institutional scholarships, and federal work-study dollars. What percentage of the gap is covered by institutional scholarships and what percentage is covered by loans depends a lot on how strong of an applicant you are in terms of grades, standardized test scores, and extracurricular activities. We'll talk more about that later. If you're anxious to find out what your EFC is, you can complete the Federal Student Aid Estimator at the Department of Education's Federal Student Aid website. Before you complete the FAFSA form, the Federal Student Aid Estimator can help you understand your options to pay for college by providing an early estimate of your EFC and eligibility for financial student aid. While your need amount will change from school to school depending on each college's COA, your EFC will be the same at every institution, though it may change from year to year. At the time of this video, the Department of Education is using the term EFC as we've discussed. However, it might be helpful to note that the term EFC is being phased out and replaced with the term Student Aid Index, or SAI. While the term is changing, the same basic approach that colleges and universities use to calculate financial need will likely remain. One of the most challenging decisions for a college student is whether to take out loans to complete college. The average college student in the U.S. borrows about $30,000. This is a significant investment. Many students, especially those who are more averse to the risk of loans, decide to work while in school, attend college part-time, live at home, or delay enrollment. Each of these decisions, however, has its own element of risk. Students who delay enrollment after high school, enroll part-time while in college, live at home while in college, or work full-time are less likely to graduate from college. Knowing this shouldn't discourage you from thinking creatively about how to pay for college, but it should encourage you to think carefully about the risks and benefits of taking a non-traditional route through college. College is challenging enough as it is, you don't need to place further barriers between yourself and your educational goals. One of the most common barriers to college completion is misinformation, and there is a lot of it out there. 
These days, everyone seems to have an opinion about the value of college. While we don't have the time to address all the skeptics, it's worth us tackling a couple of the most common myths about the cost of college. Myth number one, college isn't worth it. So is college worth it? This is a fair question. Of course, there are many ways to measure the value of a college education. One could, for example, look at outcomes related to character development, church involvement, or civic engagement. Did you know that college graduates are 21% more likely to be married? And that their likelihood of being divorced or separated is 61% lower? College graduates are more likely to report being happy, live longer, are more likely to vote, and have significantly higher rates of participating in public service, as well as civic and religious organizations. However, since we're discussing costs, let's focus on the financial value of college. According to the Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor Statistics, Americans with four-year college degrees made 98% more per hour on average than those without a degree. This percentage is up from 89% five years earlier, 85% a decade earlier, and 64% in the early 1980s. The value of a college degree is only increasing considering that the earnings premium for a college degree relative to a high school degree nearly doubled in the last three decades. There's no question that, for most, college is a financially worthwhile endeavor. In fact, over the long run, College is cheaper than free. Not going to college will cost a person $500,000 to a million dollars. In other words, the true cost of a college degree is about negative half a million to a million dollars. Myth number two, investing in a home is a sound investment, whereas investing in college is not. The ROI or return on investment for home ownership in America is significant. Imagine you had a home worth a million dollars, which is a very nice home by most standards of living. Considering things like inflation, maintenance, home insurance, and property tax, if you hold onto your home for a full 30-year mortgage term, you would be left with an average net profit in the US of around $630,000. Considering what we've already established about the financial investment of college, that the average college graduate nets $500,000 to a million dollars, the two investments are arguably comparable, assuming you're able to buy a million dollar home. Myth number three, going to community college first is always a good way to save money. Students who begin at community college with the goal of transferring and finishing their bachelor's degree at a traditional four-year college do not necessarily save on tuition costs in the long run. This is because students who start their goal of attaining a baccalaureate degree at a community college are far less likely to reach their educational goal. Those who do end up successfully transferring to a four-year college take much longer on average to get their baccalaureate degree than those who persist within a single four-year institution. Attending multiple institutions decreases the probability of obtaining a bachelor's degree and increases the amount of time required to attain a degree for those who are eventually successful. Students, especially students from low-income families who attend multiple institutions, spend more on higher education and take longer to earn their degree. This means that Unfortunately, in their attempt to save money, students who take non-traditional approaches to college often end up costing themselves more in the long run. So we've firmly established that college is worth it, but it's still expensive, so how do we keep the costs down? First, graduate on time. College is expensive. In some ways, it's even more expensive than you might think. Even the most financially savvy college student might not consider the loss of potential income for every year beyond their program's completion time that they don't graduate. The average starting salary of a college graduate is around $50,000, which means for every year longer you stay in your program, you're costing yourself at least $50,000 in potential income. Furthermore, your college costs will continue to increase. A recent study at Temple University and the University of Austin, Texas, found that two extra years at their campuses increased student debt by nearly 70%.
One of the best ways to ensure timely graduation is to avoid transferring while in college. 39% of students who transfer college at least once lose all of their earned credits in the process. In fact, on average, students who transfer lose a semester's worth of credits. This is part of the reason why students who transfer are 70% less likely to graduate than students who persist within a single institution. Second, attend an institution where you are in the top 25% of the incoming class. Earlier, we discussed that what percentage of your need is covered by institutional scholarships and what percentage is covered by loans depends a lot on how strong of an applicant you are in terms of grades, standardized test scores, and extracurricular activities. This means that at most colleges, how much your college ends up costing you depends a lot on how you measure up to your fellow applicants. If you barely make the academic requirements of a highly selective school, don't expect the school to bend over backwards to incentivize your attendance. On the other hand, if you're a strong applicant, you may just find you get the financial red carpet treatment. So far, we've discussed the cost of attendance, but we haven't talked a lot about the net price of college. The net price of a college is the cost of attendance minus the grant and scholarship amount in the aid offer. The net price is often referred to as the out-of-pocket cost. It's important to know that colleges list their respective costs differently. You may find that some list the full COA, that others break out housing from tuition, and then others list the average net price. It's important to compare apples to apples when comparing college costs. So make sure you know what number you're looking at. There are some great resources out there to help you compare tuition rates at colleges. The best is NCES IPEDS, the National Center for Education Statistics Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, NCES IPEDS. Sorry, the government isn't known for creating pithy names. College is a big investment of time and money, but it's an investment that pays off for most college graduates in the US. It remains one of the most important and effective means of upward mobility and generational wealth in our country. The cost of college can be a daunting hurdle, but it's one you can overcome. The information I've shared with you is based on years of research and experience, but it's not meant to be personal financial advice. I don't know your specific financial circumstances. If you have questions about your student aid report or your financial aid package, I'd encourage you to set up an appointment with a financial aid administrator. I hope this presentation has provided you with some insight into the financial aid process. If you have further questions about the college application process, please don't hesitate to reach out to Cairn University's admissions office. The decision of where you go to college is a significant one that will have a profound and lasting impact on your life. I pray that the Lord gives you and your family wisdom throughout the college search and application process.